This is Dr. David Johnson at Quillen College of Medicine, East Tennessee State University, and this talk video is about warfarin and blood coagulation. Blood coagulation involves a lot of factors that are made by the liver, and those are uh, transported out in the blood and function out there. The big one is thrombin, because thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrinogen is a soluble blood protein. However, fibrin is an insoluble and plugs up the clot. So when you cut your finger, blood clotting is good. However, if we have clots in our arterioles, that can be bad, especially if it results in a heart attack or strokes that can damage our hearts or damage our brains. Warfarin slows that process by inhibiting the function of vitamin K. And therefore, those clotting factors, remember, are made as liver proteins made in the liver and then gets transported out into the blood. Vitamin K is required for a number of these that are have spinning circles and uh, those are uh, so warfarin will slow those the function of those make them inactive they don't work as well and that's measured by prothrombin time also heparin is used as an anticoagulant however heparin has to be injected whereas warfarin is a pill that can be eaten and uh, heparin is measured by the throm partial thromboplastin time Vitamin K was discovered by Henrik Dam, a Danish scientist, that he termed it coagulations vitamin, and it spelled it with a K because the Germans and the Scandinavians spell coagulation with a K. Here is the structure of vitamin K. Now, at the University of Wisconsin, the scientists there were asked to try to figure out why cows were dying when they were de being dehorned. Wisconsin have a lot of dairy cattle, and so they uh, dehorn them so they don't injure each other. And those cows were dying, and so they wanted to know why. So the scientists started looking at what the cows were eating. They found out that they were eating some spoiled sweet clover, and that that spoiled sweet clover contained this compound called dicumarol, which is very similar in structure to vitamin K. So knowing that chemistry, they, were, they figured out why these cows were dying, because their vitamin K wasn't working. Working well. The Wisconsin scientists then developed this compound called warfarin, also known as Coumadin. And warfarin stands for WARF, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And the University of Wisconsin benefited from the patent of warfarin for a number of years that's used to treat patients, and it's an excellent rat poison. The rats tend to eat large amounts of it, and they bleed to death or hemorrhage to death. Vitamin K is a uh, has involves a change in the structure of the the protein by taking a glutamic acid residue and putting another carboxyl group on it to make gamma carboxyglutamate. Once that occurs, calcium can bind, and then the calcium allows the organization of the clotting factors in contact with negative phospholipids that are exposed when tissues are cut or membranes are disrupted. Now, this process requires a carboxylase and the CO2, and it requires reduced vitamin K. In the process of doing this reaction, vitamin K is oxidized. The vitamin, oxidized vitamin K is no longer functional and has to be re-reduced, and there's a reductase in our bodies that does that to recycle our vitamin K. And warfarin inhibits that process, so it slows the amount of available vitamin K that's available for this reaction and slows the formation of the functional blood clotting factors. This process is measured by a term called international normalized ratio, and it is the ratio of our patient's prothrombin time divided by a control prothrombin time. Normally, we have a pro, an INR of about 0.9 to 1.3, and in this area, we, ha, we can form clots pretty easily, so if we cut our finger, everything's fine. However, if a patient has had a heart attack or stroke, doctors want to push their INR up, so the chances of them having another heart attack or another stroke is greatly reduced. However, you don't want to push it up too high or they start bleeding. And so we shoot for an INR of about 2.5 to 4, and that works quite well. And remember, that's measured by the prothrombin time.
Here's a little device that can now be used to measure prothrombin time right in the hospital or at home. And it has an I, it shows the INR and prothrombin time, it just takes a drop of blood. Once a patient is given warfarin, it takes a while to adjust the dose up and get it steady. And some people have a very fast enzymes that metabolize their warfarin in their liver, and those are called P450 enzymes, and therefore their effective dose is very difficult for them to get an effective dose. So they have to be given more warfarin. However, some people also have very slow P450 enzymes, and they can be given too much warfarin. So they need to have their warfarin levels reduced. That's why it has to be measured. The INRs are measured on a regular basis on people that are taking warfarin. Warfarin pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics is the interaction of genes and drugs. And cytochrome P450 enzymes metabolize warfarin in our livers. Genetic polymorphisms in those P450 enzymes, those are all called CYPs or cytochrome Ps, such as 2C9 and 4F2, are involved in this. And there are single nucleotide polymorphisms in those SNPs, in those cytochromes that are called SNPs. And those result in a single DNA change based change. That results in a single amino acid change, but that can in, in, make the, uh, the cytochrome P450 inactive or make it function much more slowly. These can now be easily be determined on chips. Uh, we see advertisements for 23andMe and Ancestry.com. These are companies that provide thousands and thousands of information on our SNPs that make us different and tell us about our ancestry and how we're related to uh, different people. Uh, so that it's cheap and easy to get done. Only about 200 bucks to do this. SNPs used by warfarindosing.org. Uh, Doctors, you can use this little uh, algorithm at warfarindosing.org to calculate the, the, the dosage. Warfarin, remember, is an uh, antagonist of vitamin K. So leafy greens such as spinach, kale, and broccoli are rich in vitamin K. Vitamin K is fat soluble, therefore oily salad dressings can in increase vitamin K uptake or adding butter on your broccoli. Spinach, with oil, uh, such as olive oil, will increase vitamin K up to about tenfold, and therefore the person will need more warfarin. Intestinal E. coli also make vitamin K, and antibiotics can reduce the amount of E. coli, and therefore reduce our vitamin K, and therefore more, less warfarin is needed. If the INR gets too high, we tend to bleed. Vitamin K capsules are given in the liver. Uh, however, the liver makes these new, makes our new vitamin K uh, protein slowly, and so it takes a little while to adjust it back down, but it can be adjusted. And this is the uh, view from the top of Roan Mountain. Here is the Appalachian Trail, beautiful area of East Tennessee. Thank you.